Hey YouTube, Marshall here. Welcome back to the video version of the Realignment Podcast. Got a great conversation today. I'm speaking with Henry Olson. He is a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and is a Washington Post columnist where he spends a lot of time covering populism and the future of the American right. Aside from the big elections in Wisconsin and Chicago, the big story this week was obviously Donald Trump's indictment hearing in New York City. So I thought speaking with Henry about how the Republican Party and conservative movement is really facing this specific moment and how we should consider the race between Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis, and all the, frankly, all their also rands is going to play out. So if you're looking to set the table for the next year of our politics, this is the perfect place to start. Hope you all enjoy the conversation. Henry Olson, welcome to The Realignment. Thanks for having me, Marshall. Of course. No, I think a lot of your writing, especially going back to your book from, I believe, 2018, um, which is about Ronald Reagan and kind of a different kind of history of his presidency and the whole working class debate about the Republican Party has been really helpful in setting my foundational thinking. So I think this is a great time to check in with you, considering that we're a little more than a year um, out from the 2024 election. I just want to start at the most basic level. How would you define the new, quote unquote, Republican Party that we have in this post-2016 moment? Yeah, but it, it's uh, difficult to describe because it's still going through its birthing pains. It's still trying to define itself. It's one that is... Um, highly patriotic um, and lot, very fearful, uh, fearful of domestic uh, challenges and fearful of foreign challenges, especially that posed by China. It's one that wants somebody who sh understands that fear and will at least fight back. I say at least because in some cases, many of the voters seem to value fighting as opposed to winning. But uh, they want somebody who understands that they are afraid of the change that is happening. And they want uh, somebody who represents, if not old economic values, because there's certainly a lot of division in the new Republican Party about economic policy, uh, old cultural values in America that's dedicated to equality of under the law, equality of opportunity, not equity of outcome, as is uh, often pushed. Uh, Repub uh, an America that is uh, honors its past, doesn't tear it down. These are the sorts of things that unite today's Republican Party. You know, I know that the center-left listeners of the show will be screaming at me to ask the following follow-up question, though. Where does... I don't want to sound like a cliche here, but like, where does like January 6th fit into the patriotism disco discourse? I think where does Marjorie Taylor Greene invoking the national divorce fit in the discourse? That's just kind of interesting to me because you've sort of seen in response to those two incidents specifically, a lot of Democrats start to say, well, actually, we're the patriotic ones because of this, this, and that reason. So can you just talk about where patriotism as a category fits in the 2023 moment in a way that would have been different, let's say, if it was 2003 and we're fighting about freedom fries? <laughs> well, you know, 2003, the Republican, and when I speak at the party, I try and speak about the mass of the voters as opposed to its leaders or its donors or its intellectuals or its media personalities because ultimately a party is what its voters uh support and it may take leaders and so forth a little while to follow around and uh and, and follow their voters but they eventually do uh and, and so patriotism today compared to 2003, is, uh, again, around the idea of fear that we are losing, fear that we are losing what made us great and made us a distinct nation. 2003 was the opposite. There was confidence uh, that you had um, an America that uh, either was about to or had taken down Saddam Hussein, uh, depending on what... Uh, I forget exactly when we entered Baghdad in 2003. You know, one that had fought back after 9-11, one that was unchallenged around the globe, uh, um, and one in which a lot of the cultural changes that we've seen in the last 20 years were only uh, beginning to become really serious. You know, this is a 
this is a year before California voters approved the Defense of Marriage Act, you know, uh, Proposition 8, uh, that would have outlawed uh, same-sex marriage. So the amount of cultural change we've seen in the last 20 years is, is mind-boggling. And so today's patriotism is more defensive in its crouch than it would have been 20 years ago. With respect to January 6th, and this is something where I part company with most Republicans, I'm extremely angry about January 6th. Um, I can't support Donald Trump as a result of January 6th. You know, he tried to um, undermine our democratic transfer of power, something that Ronald Reagan lauded in his first inaugural as a bedrock of our country. Most Republicans don't see it that way. Um, it's not that they agree necessarily that it was right, but rather that they don't see it as an insurrection and they don't see it as something that is a serious break with the with the nation's past. Um, you know, if I take a look at where Republicans stand on the question of voter fraud uh, in 2020, you know, you'd see probably two thirds of Republican voters think that the election was stolen. Um, but very, only about half of that or a quarter of that prioritize that. They're soft fraud adherence, not hard fraud adherence. And that's something uh, you know is, uh, that, that media often misses, that there's a very wide range of views within the Republican Party, much as there is within the Democratic Party. And I don't see a, a whole lot of resonance for uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene's desire for a national divorce, but it does represent some, you know, more than a couple of people in the Republican Party, which is if they don't want to, the way they would phrase it, I think, is if they don't want to live with us, we don't want to be in the same country as them. What I'm trying to understand here is a really helpful uh, sentence you gave earlier, which is that a, a party is what its voters support. That to me is a little difficult because on the one hand, you could say to yourself, yes, that's true, right? You know, Republicans, a party is people at the end of the day and their cumulative viewpoint they have is what the party produces. I think that gets at what we've always been interested in, which is this, this gap between the GOP's national policy output and the actual voters. So for example, think of the Bush um, administration after Bush's um, re-election, the focus on social security privatization, obviously the entitlement spending debate, um, Donald Trump's continued um, battle over social security entitlement cuts that you're kind of see coming into the 2024 campaign. So I guess within those examples, what is the Republicans party, the Republican party's position on let's say social security? There isn't one. And that's because there's division within the Republican party that uh, you have a large number of Republicans who would favor the traditional Bush Ryan approach to Social Security, which is we should be more concerned about its costs than the security of its benefit division. But um, a equal number of Republicans, and according to a poll I took in 2021 of Trump voters, a larger number of Trump general election voters disagree with that. But it's far from unanimous that you have. The question I posed was, what do you give, care more about, even if neither one is exactly in line with your views? Do you, or, do you, or is it more important to keep Social Security benefits, even if payroll taxes rise? Or is it more important to keep taxes level, even if benefits have to be cut? And about 60, 63 percent of the Trump voters picked the first option. But that still leaves 37 percent or so who picked the second. And uh, the margin was larger among the former Obama voters, those working class voters who are now the new recruits into the Republican Party. They favored it by a larger margin. The old guard Republicans who are likelier to vote in party primaries, it was closer to 50-50 or a little bit in favor of the orthodox position. So this is a battle that's being fought in the Republican Party right now. What I'd say is that 20 years ago, I think there was much more of a consensus in favor of the old position, the uh, favor, worry more about the cost. But of course, then this is the problem that Republicans have had for, as I occupy my book, when you deviate from the Reagan consensus that a safety net in, uh, is as, as important as economic growth and start to say we value economic growth and the risks that brings and it's along with the opportunity more than we value the security of a social safety net which was what bush's sub rosa message of 2005 was 
you get out of connection with those independents and soft Democrats who are willing to vote for you. And the fact is the Republican Party has been the number two party in party identification since 1932. You know, when you're the number two party, you have to get people who aren't on your side to join you. And when you take positions that alienate the people who you need to join you, you might want to rethink those positions. I'd love to hear, given your point about the Republicans being the number two party, is how do you then reconcile the the Reagan years with that fact, right? So the, the landslide victory is obviously culminating in the 49 states, um, George H.W. Bush's um, victory. You then have a three-way race in 1992 that in many ways you could argue that Ross Perot helped swing to Bill Clinton. And then you have, I'm sure you remember all these books, the uh, 2005 era, oh my gosh, Karl Rove was building a permanent conservative majority in this country it's kind of like the the flip the the doomerism flips between either side of the aisle in different periods and that same doomerism that many people on the right feel i think was felt by progressives in the um wake of the bush re-election um so what explain why the right has been so dominant during certain periods but at the same time hasn't been able to be as successful a party yeah, um, well, it depends on what you define as the right as well, is that if you were to go and ask people on the right, they would say the last 30 years has been um, a, a victory squandered by feckless leaders, that we could have cut government more, that government people want that. And so if you were on the right, they would view that period between 1994 and 2016 or even today as one where a majority was squandered. And I think the truth is that First of all, what Ronald Reagan did has never been fully appreciated, I think. In the research for my book, you, know, you take a look at where the Republican Party was in 1980, and only about 22% of Republican people said they were Republicans. 44% said they were Democrats. By 1985, that gap shrinks to single digits. But it's stayed there roughly since then. Um, and so Republicans continually are able to win victories, but victories of a certain sort. Uh, victories of a negative sort, where when Obamacare goes too far against the new Reagan consensus that had a better balance between growth and safety nets, uh, the old Reagan majority comes up and says, no, we don't want that. But then when Republicans say, well, okay, well, let's push in the other direction and try and break the Reagan balance in favor of uh, more economic growth and less security, the voters push back and say, well, we don't want that either. So what you've got is, uh, in my view, is um, the inability of Republicans to understand what the Reagan legacy was and consequently squandering it when they have that opportunity and a Democratic base that is uh, remains unreconciled to the Reagan consensus and pushes its own party when they are in power uh, to its own set of extremes. And I think that's one of the reasons why you see this growing frustration, this growing anger, this growing move to independence. People may lean toward one party or another, but they yearn for something different and they're not getting it. And I think what they yearn for is the updating of the Reagan message. And I guess the obvious question then would be, what do you think an updated Reagan message would be in the context of 2023 or 2024? Yeah, um, I think, so Ronald Reagan's, I'm sorry about my nose, I, allergies, the itching, sorry. Um, the um, Ronald Reagan's message is often tied up with freedom. And certainly that was essential to Ronald Reagan's political beliefs and political success. But more than that, Ronald Reagan believed in the dignity of the individual. He would say things throughout his career that libertarians or anti-New Deal conservatives often didn't pick up, but I'm sure his... Democratic converts did, things like uh, talking in the Creative Society speech about how, uh, which he gave in 1966, about how we should uh, ensure that um, we're not just giving people enough money to, uh, to live by, but to give them a few luxuries so that they have a life worth living. Where in the speech where he talks about, uh, made some famous endorsing Barry Goldor, he says, no, uh, we conservatives, we agree that uh, no one should be denied medical care because of a lack of funds. Um, and that's which is why in his presidency, he could support an expansion of Medicare. Because for him, that was not inconsistent with what the dignity of the human person required. 
And so an updated Reaganism would put that at its central core. It would say that what we need to do is maintain American culture and uh, embrace the expansion of the American promise to people who had been socially or legally excluded from it. But that's uh, what we've been doing for 200 years is expanding and uh, renewing and updating the American promise to remove its imperfections, not rejecting it. You know, Ronald Reagan's policy and foreign policy was peace through strength. He believed in alliances, but he also did not believe in um, taking risks with American lives overseas, uh, which would mean uh, I think he would be very supportive of what we're doing in Ukraine. And he would also be very leery of unilateral American intervention to, say, stop Iran from getting a nuclear bomb that he, he rarely, if ever, wanted American power to be used. And in domestic policy, I think Reagan would love to cut. Uh, updated Reaganism would be one that focused on what Reagan focused on, which was uh, taking benefits uh, and tax breaks from people who don't need it. Reagan was happy to raise taxes uh, or apply taxes to Social Security benefits on people making above average incomes, because as he wrote in one letter, I don't uh, I don't mind taxing it because they shouldn't be getting it in the first place. You know, they so a Republican philosophy that focuses on an active government for people in need, but a stingy government for people who are not in need. And believe me, we spend trillions of dollars over a 10 year period, hundreds of billions a year on people and institutions that do not need government subsidy. Um, I think that would be something that would capture the American middle and make the Republican party the new number one party. Okay, so then the obvious other follow-up question here then is, is this your version of a DeSantis endorsement? Because various phrases and articulation, you and I'm not saying you were doing this, but I think it's very straightforward to take the story you were telling and say to yourself, oh, like and Ron DeSantis is the embodiment of that story. Yeah. So I want to hear Ron DeSantis say it. And the thing is that when Ron DeSantis talks and when Ron DeSantis emphasizes, he still seems to be emphasizing the sort of issues that uh, resonate with uh, the fearful base. And I think when he does eventually declare, he should have an optimistic message, one that speaks not only towards the fear, but one that speaks towards the hope. And I think he has a lot of policies in Florida that would suggest that that's where he's going. But when he makes his national pronouncements, it tends to gravitate back towards those base concerns. And I think that's what even as he's now nationally known, according to you know, most people have an opinion of him now, and that will only grow over the next couple of months. Um, he does not do much better than Donald Trump in matchups with Joe Biden. And somebody who embraces this philosophy and makes that that part of their credo, I think, should be running well ahead of Trump because they will be attractive to the sort of person who doesn't like the Democratic Party's move to the left, um, thinks that Biden is too old, but is fearful of MAGA Republicanism. I think the interesting question to ask, though, then, is the the optimism dynamic. I think one of the most revelatory things I've read in retrospect is um, Peter Thiel's uh, comments to George Packer um, in 2013 in George Packer's book, The Unwinding. And Peter Thiel's point was that he thought that the Romney American optimism 2012 perspective was actually out of step with the electorate. And there's actually a sizable part of the electorate who wanted to hear something darker, less optimistic. Um, and that very much, um, not at a popular vote level, but at a, you know, how the rules are played level resonated with Donald Trump in 2015 going into that American car carnage inaugural address. So what I'd love to hear from you then is how would you advise a GOP candidate navigate a primary where very clearly there's a huge portion of the Republican Party's base who wants to hear um, the non-optimistic message. If you have a party where two thirds of people think there's voter fraud, if let me put it this way, if I thought that there was voter fraud, I would not be optimistic on most questions facing American life right now. So how do you how would you balance that um, unoptimistic primary with the fact that there's a general election electorate that you need to actually win over? You know, I think what you need to do is what Reagan did. You know, Ray, there was a lot of anger and fear when Reagan became a popular figure in the 1960s. You know, 
think about what was happening. You had the civil rights revolution. You had a massive expansion in government. You had the first cultural challenges, abortion, uh, drugs, the student counterculture. Um, heck, Frank Sinatra could still chart in 1966 because um, the dominance of rock music had not yet <laughs> set in, you know, it was still a competition. Um, so there was a lot of fear, but what Reagan did was acknowledge the fear and channel it towards hope. What Donald Trump does is channel the fear and uh, recognize the fear and channels it towards anger, which is unproductive. You know, to use a term uh, that the, is modern pop culture, you know, uh, he, you know, he gives in to anger and moves people to the dark side. And I think what you need to do is recognize what Romney never did, which was that there's anger and fear out there. But channel that in a way to say, I hear this and here's my solution for you. And this is how we can restore you and renew the American dream. Romney thought the election wasn't bad and never understood the suffering that a lot of people was going through. I think somebody who acknowledges the suffering is not Pollyannish, somebody who does not simply try to apply ideology, which is something Ronald Reagan bitterly criticized in his 1977 speech to CPAC, uh, where he said that um, conservatism is principle, but ideology is its enemy. Now, how often do we hear an ideological argument from Republicans that this is the ideal and all the facts have to be lopped off in order to fit it? Uh, that's not conservatism. It's also not winning. And so DeSantis, if he were to embrace that, would be somebody who would acknowledge the fear and channel it towards hope, recognizing that running against somebody like Trump with his own brand and his own thing, you're not going to get in the primary, the diehards. You're just not. But what you have to be is acceptable for them in the general election and build your own coalition. And one way to look at uh, the hope that DeSantis could draw on is what happened in Georgia. You know, Donald Trump comes in there in the epicenter of a voter fraud conspiracy. He endorses a slate of candidates. He goes all in. And not only do his candidates lose, but at the top of the ticket, they get annihilated. I mean, former Senator David Perdue loses by 50 points. And by much more, and this is the important point, much more than the polls had suggested. Why? It's because lots of people who were not habitual Republican primary voters came in because of the hope. Uh, that they saw and the willingness to say, okay, I need to get in and defeat this fear. DeSantis could very well be the recipient of a similar influx of people who are disaffected from Trumpism and disaffected from the Democratic Party who say, I want to vote in a Republican primary, maybe for the first time, maybe for the first time uh, since 2012, and because this person gives me hope again. And so I would not necessarily go with these polls because at this point, because we don't know what the primary electorate is going to be. Trump expanded it in 2016. DeSantis could expand it in 2020. You know, it's interesting when you're talking about Republican errors in 2012. I just read a, a, a good book by Jonathan Alter on the 2012 election and the way that he articulated the issue and that actually syncs with previous comments you've made about the 2022 midterms is that during the especially the Obama-Biden era, Republicans have thought that elections are referendums. So if it's 2012, the referendum is, okay, Obama said that the economy and the unemployment rate was going to be X. It's not X. America's comeback team. Mitt Romney, Paul Ryan, if it's a referendum, they're going to vote down and we're going to win the presidency. Um, that strategy doesn't work because actually the Obama campaign was successful at transforming it from a referendum election into a choice election. Who do you like better, Mitt Romney or Barack Obama? People obviously choose Barack Obama. Same thing in many respects happens in the 2022 midterms. You think there's going to be this huge red wave because it's a referendum election. Is Joe Biden doing well? Is he not doing well? Actually, it turns out it's a mix of a you know referendum, obviously, but also a very discreet choice. How do you advise Republicans think through this decades-long dilemma dynamic? First of all, what happened in 22 was unbelievably historic, that midterm elections do tend to be referenda elections. Presidential elections usually tend to be choice elections. The 2012 error was thinking that you could win a presidential election without presenting an alternative choice that recognized the suffering of the voters that you needed. You know, um, I was the only Republican who publicly predicted uh, 
uh, Obama's victory in National Review on twenty in twenty twelve, uh, precisely because of that. The if you you look like a young man, so you may not remember. I'm thirty one years old, so I look much younger than I actually am. I was very I, I very actively remember twenty 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 twelve. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Republicans like Michael Barone said he, Romney was going to win by five points and sweep all the swing states. Recall Roe was saying the same thing. Literally every Republican was sitting there thinking this is a coronation party, and then it's not even close. It's not even close. You know, I only missed one state. You know, my career got turbocharged with that but um, which, which state did you miss by the way florida the closest okay. yeah <laughs> um but so so 2012 was a discrete thing 2022 though you know you take a look this is never this is not ever this has never happened in the last century that an unpopular president um and a significantly unpopular president lost single digit seats and gained seats in the senate and that's because he turned it into a choice election um so I think what you first need to do is recognize that if a unpopular incumbent can make a midterm into a choice election for the first time in a century, that the nature of the choice that he presented, which is rampant, unrepentant Trumpism, is a death knell. You have to present a different choice. So how, what's the path forward? Well, the path forward, obviously, is to not nominate Trump. But then you have the problem, which is that the majority of Republican voters want to see that fighter who takes on the defense of American values across the board and is not an ideologue. Um, there's a way to phrase that for a Republican electorate, and there's a way to phrase it for both a Republican electorate and the general election. So far, I'm seeing DeSantis phrase it more for the Republican electorate, and I don't think you can run like you did 50 years ago, one part can campaign in a primary and a second campaign in general election. Yeah, can you explain the theory there? Because I to, to make it clear how people thought about it. Yeah, the theory used to be that you could run uh, to the party base in the primary and tack to the center in the general election. And that would work when you didn't have uh, the sort of media attention that you get in the primary. That what, you, what we see today was not what, was the case in the 60s and the 70s and the 50s. We don't get uh, the full on media coverage from Iowa through you know, whenever uh, until the 1980s. You know, even when Reagan runs in 84, the Iowa caucus is an afterthought. You know, well, the reason it becomes not an afterthought is because George W. Bush upsets Ronald Reagan there. There's no media traipsing through the snow in December with George. H.W. Bush in um, uh, 1979. Uh, Ronald Reagan doesn't get into the race until the first week of November of 1970. So at that point, when your primary campaign is often not even a primary campaign, it's behind the scenes, it's talking to activists, you could run to the right and then run to the center. You can't do that now. I mean, every word of these people is broadcast. You know, Ron DeSantis steps out of of Florida, and he's got cameras trailing him, you cannot, you only have one chance to make a first impression. And that first impression has to be one that resonates both with the swing voters you need and the base swing voters that you need. In other words, what I call the MAGA light voters, the voters who are willing to look beyond Trump, but want somebody who strikes Trumpian themes, and the swing voters who may not want strong degrees of Trumpian themes, but are also dissatisfied with a lot of things in, in modern day America. DeSantis can't get that right. He can win a primary, but he'll have a much harder general election. And this seems to be, and I really appreciate how you're helping us kind of get into the strategic mindset here. It seems as if a lot of the DeSantis decisions, especially um, as demonstrated by his, uh, I mean, it's unclear what his position on Ukraine is now, but like, what's, let's say what the initial um, leaning towards that Trump part of the base U Ukraine position, um, this also brings in the more like superficial stuff, like his hand gestures and general affect. His strategy now seems to be, if I make myself as much like Trump as I can, He's obviously not going to take it too far, but he's, he thinks that there's, he seems to think there's some like happy medium space 
which he can then achieve. It seems to me that you're articulating the danger of that strategy. Is it a like it's unclear whether that would actually work, and the polls are not indicating that that's working, um, even in the primary. But that would also leave you in a general election vulnerability point um, with a lot of those suburban. Because the thing that's so funny, I mean, I'm wondering what you think about this. The, the, the number one takeaway I had from 2022 is just that, and the and the Biden primary win in 2020 is that the least sexy quadrant of American politics, these like center adjacent suburban voters, are just the center of everything, um, literally right now. And it seems like those are really the voters that Joe Biden was made um, in a factory or a lab to almost like attract and at least um, have choose his side. Like, to what degree do you think Republicans should be thinking about that category? Republicans have to be thinking about a number of categories. Um, that's the thing is, it's the, and for what re- Republicans need to do, uh, they need to think uh, of putting together uh, a four or five part coalition. A few years ago, I described it, you know, I tried to be um, memorable and catchy. So I invented animals in a zoo. You, know, that you need to have elephants, rhinos, tigers, and rams. That uh, what does that mean? That means you need to have all factions of the Republican Party, the elephants. And that means you need to be able to go from the hard MAGAites to the old guard who are the sort of person who you know, they liked Trump because he governed like a conservative. They don't they don't want to restrict free trade. They like immigration. They want tax cuts. These are the sort of people who like Nikki Haley or Mike. So you need all of them in your camp. Then you need. The rhinos, which is the suburbanites who are moderate, who are willing to back Republicans under certain circumstances, but are not conservative. You need to have a large number of them. And that's uh, your suburban constituency that you need to focus on. You need to have tigers. Uh, Trump is great Republicans. That was my attempt to be cute in naming the blue collar whites who are now part and parcel of the Republican Party. But you have to keep stroking them. You know, is that suddenly you turn back and say, you know, hey, I want to privatize your Social Security. You create a wedge issue with these people because they don't. So you need those three. And then you need Rams, recently arrived migrants. That's my catchy phrase for the working class uh, Asian and Latino voters that uh, uh, you began to see Trump attract. And, you you know, for all of the non-movement in 2022, basically what happened was the Trump gain in 2020 was stabilized and in some cases slightly added to. So you didn't get a big move of Hispanics over to the right, but you didn't get a move back to the Democrat majorities either. That Republicans in 2022 maintained the inroads they made in 2020. So it is very, if your focus is solely on your primary, you're going to be forgetting about rhinos. You're going to be forgetting about rams. You're going to be focusing on tigers and the other forms of elephant. And that means you will not have a message that appeals to those other groups. You need to have a message that hits that balance running in the primary. And I think you can. I think that's what the sweet spot is between the marriage between the old guard and the MAGA light, the MAGA adjacent crowd. DeSantis needs to win overwhelming majorities of both of those to defeat Trump. Um, right now, he's not winning overwhelming majorities of the old guard because they're still interested in Haley or Pence or Pompeo. And he's losing ground among the MAGA adjacent as Trump is catching up his campaign. Um, if you focus exclusively on a primary, what are you going to say to the moderate suburbanite uh, who um, is perfectly happy to vote for a moderate sounding Democrat if they're afraid of the Republican but doesn't want to vote for a liberal Democrat? Um, what are you going to say to them? In Florida, DeSantis had a good message for them. But so far, it's not clear that he's sending that message in the general election. The same thing is true of recently arrived migrants. I and mean, one of the great messages of Florida in 2022 has, uh, has been the massive movement of Latinos of all categories, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, and non-Cuban or Puerto Rican Latinos, largely from Central and South America, who have flocked DeSantis's Republican Party. What's he going to say to the Mexicans in the Rio Grande Valley or the Phoenix metropolitan area or the uh, Nevada metropolitan area? If he runs a primary campaign that doesn't talk to them, he shouldn't expect them to come home in the general. You know, here's what I really wonder here. I wonder where you think individual 
political talent comes down on all of us. Because Reagan is an interesting president to study from your perspective because he combines obviously the charisma and talent of a literal movie star um, with the vision and broad perspective thing that you think is very important here. It just seems to be the easy reason why I just see Trump winning the nomination, despite everything you're describing, um, or not in the sense you're not saying that Trump can't win, but saying that the reason why I see this all just leading to a Trump win is that you both don't have the vision dynamics you're discussing, but also just at a political talent level. Um, Ron DeSantis is not charismatic. He can't compete on stage with talent at the level of Trump. Um, I think Nikki Haley is a non-entity in that context. I think Tim Scott is charismatic. I've seen him in person. I still think he comes off as like the nice high school football coach, not the actual president compared to Donald Trump in a Republican primary base. So to what degree do you think the generational issue we have here is just that maybe when we write the history of this decade, we'll just say to ourselves like, yeah, you know what? If you know the stars aligned in a different way, or you gave a Republican Bill Clinton's Bill, if you gave a Republican Bill Clinton at his peak's genes, um, someone could have pulled it off. But that just isn't what we actually have here. So, talent. Yeah, what do you think I, about that? I, I think that there is a strategic and a charismatic quality to presidential leadership, and um, uh, all the indications are that. DeSantis uh, is charisma shy. Uh, that's going to be a real problem. Uh, the question is, in any situation, how do you make up for uh, that? Um, you know, certainly we have seen races before where non-charismatic candidates can come out of a primary. You know, uh, I don't think anyone's ever going to say Michael Dukakis lights up a room when he enters into it, but yet he defeated six other Democrats to become uh, the nominee in 1988. Um, but yeah, there is a, a calculative strategic element that is often lacking in people, uh, who run uh, for president that they don't understand the challenge that they are facing, but there is the simple political talent, the charisma question, uh, and you can't fake charisma. You've got it or you don't. I think for the, you know, last big questions here, we have not discussed a specific quadrant of the Republican Party, which are the just never Trumpers. Um, you've written that they're the 10% of the Republican Party um, who just like refuse to support Trump. Here's what I just don't understand. Like, why can't why can't never Trumpers just endorse Joe Biden? It, 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 it's actually just at a pure analytical level, deeply frustrating to me. There are Republicans who just went for LBJ. They wouldn't go for Goldwater. There's numerous there are plenty of like there are plenty of Ronald Reagan Democrats. Um, why cannot the never Trumpers just give it up? I, I, I genuinely just as a political professional, it's just intellectually yeah. frustrating to me. Yeah, I think um, a lot of them just, you know, are in the kind of position that to go back, uh, a lot of Republican leaders did endorse LBJ. A lot of them didn't. They grumbled. Uh, and I think the the sort of person who endorsed LBJ is the sort of person who did endorse Joe, Joe Biden, the, uh, you know, the, the Jeff Flake, the uh, Cindy McCain, the John Kasich, those sort of person, they're gone. Um, the never Trump Republican, and, and I think Liz Cheney is now in that boat. You know, she is effectively the most right wing Democrat in America, uh, since she does not seem to have changed her views, unlike many media people whose views have evolved as their partisan affiliation have evolved. Um, you know, I think they want to be part of a party and uh, they are still uncomfortable with the Democratic Party that they would they know they would largely be a minority and, you know, a powerless minority. So if Trump were to get the nomination again, I think you might see more of that because this will be post January 6th, um, unlike 2020, which obviously was pre-January 6th, I think you will see more of those people say, this is fundamental uh, and we can't do this. But as long as there's a chance of regaining control of their party, they will hold that fire. So the last big question here, I love I love this framing. Um, so you said that before 2015, um, the central debate that you could look at um, all Republican conservative debates through was this debate of to what extent um, is the GOP, uh, to what degree should the GOP be the vehicle for the conservative movement? 
This yeah. is why you're talking about Republicans in name only. You're kind of pushing moderates out of the party. That very, very pre-2015 context. Obviously, because Donald Trump in many ways was not a traditional conservative in 2015, he kind of shot in the, through the middle of that debate. Um, while still calling himself a conservative, he didn't call himself a moderate. So he kind of like took the third way um, in, in that entire dynamic. Um, you say, though, that the new question that really undergirds Republican politics is to what degree should the Republican Party be a personal vehicle for Donald Trump? Um, is that a debate that is settled in the Republican primary or is that a debate that has to be settled in 2025, 2026? Um, so like, even if, so for example, let's say Trump loses the primary, hard to imagine Trump not finding some way to re-inject himself into the space, into those dynamics. How do you think about how that debate would ever be resolved in the way that the vehicle for the conservative movement um, debate was resolved? Yeah, you know, I think it will be significantly molded by the primary. You know, let's not forget Donald Trump's age, that Donald Trump will be 78 years old at, uh, if he if he were to win the presidency. He would be 78 years old when he would he was inaugurated. So let's say uh, if he loses in 2024, that means he's 82. Donald Trump is not running for president at 82. This is his last shot. So the question of personal vehicle gets decided in 2024. But there's the broader question, which is the Trumpist legacy and uh, there's an element of the Republican Party, you know, between the old guard and the never Trumpers, a third to 40 percent that basically don't want any Trumpist legacy. They don't want the angry fighter. They don't want the policy uh, changes. They want the party. Uh, they want to go back to 2014, where the battle is between Mitch McConnell and Tickers. Um And then you've got the people who are debating to what extent, you know, what is Trumpism? Is it something that's policy focused? Is it a, a, a never ending anger grievance uh, uh, parade? And that's where you get the difference between say a J.D. Vance and a Ron DeSantis and a Josh Hawley who will have policy focuses and to some extent Tom Cotton and Marco Rubio and people like MTG and Carrie Lake and Mike Gates who are a never ending grievance person. We don't know the answer to that. And I don't think that battle will be settled in 2024 unless Ron DeSantis surprises, I suspect, both of us and comes out with this perfectly calibrated, um, glowing message that unites Republicans of all stripes and attracts these uh, swing voters and wins a 10 point victory and has the great, you know, nirvana that uh, that Republicans ought to be hoping for. You know, if that happens, then, well. DeSantis has remade the party. Um, but barring that, I think this is a battle that will go on beyond Trump's personality. But of course, if Trump does win in 2024, the nomination, that makes it likelier that a Trump heir in 2028 would uh, be the nominee. And if Trump is the president, then it's quite clear that the 2028 Republican um nominee will be Trumpist in that way, not Trumpist in the policy way. That is an excellent place uh, to leave the conversation. Henry, thank you so much for joining me on The Realignment. Thank you for having me.